introduction and uh, good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, good morning, Srinivas. Um, uh, it's very nice to have you on here at this fire search chat. So the fire search chat will work. It's easy. We are going to discuss about space drift management. And uh, um, maybe six or seven years ago, when I started my work in the ministry, then uh, no one was talking about space tra traffic management. Back then, it was like, you know, it was a more academic to topic. Many scientists were talking about, you know, the theoretical future that we should deal with it. But in the last years, um, I think maybe three, four years, space traffic management and topic around SST, uh, space surveillance and tracking, has become more, more and more relevant. So in, also in European Union, in European Council and European Commission, uh, we are talking about this. How should we deal with uh, space traffic management in Europe? And uh, of course, the United States is uh, maybe, it's very, very difficult to say who is leading, but they are generally you know, creating the way. Yes. And right. uh, having, having the, you know, it's very healthy competition. But why we are here is that uh, in the situation, so maybe six years ago, we had not that many satellites. Today, it's completely different, right? And uh, technologies and components are getting smaller and smaller, which has enabled to build uh, small CubeSats, uh, also launching uh, not only tens of satellites, but today we are talking about thousands. So it's uh, mega constellations are tens of thousands even objects that are being uh, sent to space. Now the question is how to regulate it, that we are not destroying the environment where we are uh, where we are living and where we are working. And of course, these satellites are being used to make our lives you know, easier, better, right, yeah, comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, therefore, it's, it might maybe sound uh, strange, but because space traffic management, why are we talking about space traffic management uh, in a cybersecurity conference? But here are the cybersecurity aspects, right? How can we uh, change the information between each other is a topic that we are going to talk about. And uh, how can we be sure that no one else is going to change the orbit of a random right. spacecraft, let's say. So these are the topics uh, that we are definitely going to uh, talk about. And uh, why Estonia is, is talking about this topic, why, 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 we are, why Estonia is interested in it, is because uh, Yes, we are not leading in uh, global space policy or space law, uh, but we see from the technology point of view that we can contribute also to this area. Uh, so therefore, having the discussion I think here today is, uh, is re relevant, and also having uh, you as an expert uh, uh, from GMV who knows uh, the technology and also the policy part. So really, uh, thank you, thank you for being here, and um, maybe I know that. Uh, I did some research about you before, and uh, uh, I saw that uh, you have done uh, Srinivas a lot of research. Um, maybe you can tell about your backgrounds, what you have done so far with SSD, and yeah. Sure, Paul. First of all, thanks for having me here, and it's really great to be here and to see that, like Estonia, is getting engaged in the space traffic management topic, and providing their expertise in, from the field of experience they have gathered from uh, cybersecurity and uh, uh, blockchain technology development and so on. Um, uh, from myself, uh, I have uh, pursued aerospace engineering during my masters, and following that one, I did my PhD. Uh, I wrote my thesis on the topic of uh, cataloging maintenance for uh, space traffic management and also for the SSA purposes. Later on that one, I worked for ESA in Space Debris Office, where we were dealing with a lot of um, uh, activities which were supporting the development of European uh, capabilities in terms of tracking, processing and providing services for space traffic management itself. Or uh, space traffic management itself is a relatively new term. Um, before that one, it started with just SSA, that is space situational awareness. And later on, it's the subdomain of it, it became SST, that is space surveillance and tracking. And then later on nowadays, like it's called space domain awa awareness and uh, space traffic management. So uh, even the terminology is ev um, evolving as uh, the technology and the concept of it 
are getting more concrete. Uh, what's the best definition for SSD, maybe for the audience also, to define what's the exact difference between space surveillance and tracking term and right. space traffic management? Maybe you can... Sure. Um, so we, we can start with SSA. So SSA, Space Situational Awareness, is a, a, it was actually coined by the uh, defense and military entities uh, in the early 80s and 90s. So this involves knowing not only the uh, like the objects, uh, the man-made objects, but also like uh, in knowing your meteoroids which are orbiting around the Earth, like your space weather, and also this went beyond the Earth orbits, so extended uh, like for the heliocentric orbits as well, where like you have the asteroid belt and the comets and so on and so forth. So the space situational awareness com encompasses all of this domain. And uh, SST is a small, uh, like now the one of the verticals of this SSA domain, where they are dedicating the development of tracking systems or tracking capabilities. So as the name itself states, it's surveillance and tracking. So knowing and awareing of your domain is SST part of it. And the STM part of it is again uh, like the extension of SST. So once you have the data, what do you do with it, how to do with it, and then when to do with it, right? So these are the main uh, basic fundamental questions one can ask. So whether you're operating your spacecraft uh, in a risky environment, or like even if you're planning your mission in the early stage itself, whether uh, to dedicate sufficient amount of onboard fuel to perform the collision avoidance maneuvers or so on. And then who performs it, who should uh, avoid the collision, who tracks the data. So this encompasses the whole uh, umbrella of space traffic management. Yeah, very good explanation. Um, you are from GMV, right? So uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> what is GMV doing in the field of SST? Let's start uh, with there. So what, it's a private company, so right. what do you see there? Or yeah. Uh, maybe before um, introducing my company, GMV, mm -hmm. in the SSE domain, I can just shortly introduce like w the history of GMV itself. Yeah. So it's uh, GMV stands for Group of Aerospace Engineers in Spanish. It's a Spanish company. Mm -hmm. It was a spin-off of uh, University of Madrid in um, l late 70s. So it's now a 38-year-old company. Uh, since then, it has grown significantly. Now we are like over 3,000 people uh, who are working for GMV. And... Uh, in the space sector, we operate, except for integrating the satellites and launching the satellites, so we provide all the other services relating to the space domain, whether it's uh, mission analysis, mission designing, to uh, ground segment integration, operational support, and even the upstream activities such as the like, uh, data distribution and data processing for Earth observation satellites or navigation satellites and so on and so forth. So we have like full pipeline of services uh, and uh, products that like we provide in the space industry. In SSA domain itself, uh, we are one of the largest. We are kind of uh, proud of it. So within GMV, we are over 110 engineers just working on the topic of SSA and SST. So uh, we have been serving our trans-European clients uh, in this uh, sector for uh, last 10 years, um, or since 2009, when ESA initiated uh, to have a small group dedicated and understanding the situational awareness part of it. Since then, uh, we have uh, provided the operational system for both civilian and military entities across Europe, including uh, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, um, also uh, Poland, Romania, and so forth. Like, yeah. um, also, NATO, uh, we have uh, provided uh, certain uh, operational units and uh, software components for them. And um, the same goes for the German Space Force, which was created quite recently. So we are building their uh, full uh, system for uh, mission controlling and operating their satellites and situational awareness center. From a technology provider's perspective, we are doing great uh, development there. How do you see the market? Because uh, today, every year, we can see new, new startups in the field of uh, space traffic management, in the field of SST, uh, who are selling uh, weather data to companies who are uh, doing data exchange. Uh, but we also know that uh, a number of constellations, they have issues creating revenue. So the question is, where is the money <laughs> coming? And do you really see a huge potential 
especially in the commercial sector here. Right. So there are two aspects to it. One is uh, if you are thinking about data generation part of it, mm -hmm. and until today, as we speak, like uh, there is one single entity which is uh, capable of providing it. This is uh, US Stratcom from USA, uh, which was under Department of Defense. Um, it was announced in the directive four years ago. It will move to Department of Commerce, but it has been very slow. And the intention of moving it to Department of Commerce itself is that like, they want to procure the data from uh, other entities as well. They are spending billions in just building up the space fence and tracking system. And uh, there is a huge uh, potential for commercial players to engage in, generate this data, and provide services based on that one. The second part is that like, the engagement itself, now I'm saying. Uh, so the, right until today, so most of the satellites are operated by national or international entities or government organizations. Very recently, in the last two, three, four years, the new space sector has evolved quite significantly, and we can see that like, there are multiple uh, commercial players which are coming into picture. And they are relying on these government entities, mm -hmm. but it might happen whatever the reason might be. So as we are seeing that like, the global political situation is ex extremely dynamic, and uh, if the bilateral uh, situation is not that great, then it might happen that like one might cut off the services. But these are crucial infrastructure, and the company has invested uh, the significant portion of their infrastructure development in the space itself. So any kind of uh, damage to those will affect them significantly. So in order to prevent that, they have to rely on more uh, rely, uh, accountable entity. Right, so and this could be the commercial players, and this is where the data market is very much in need as of now. So you see, earlier governments were basically the main main customers. So you can really see that the mega constellations are interested in buying uh, SST data, or let's say results how they have been calculated. <laughs> uh, yeah, whether they are interested, uh, we are not sure, but the need is definitely there. Mm -hmm. So uh, interest varies from. Uh, person to person who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, in my experience itself, uh, I started my career in SSA domain in 2011. And at that time, the first conference I participated, we were talking to the first CubeSat, commercial CubeSat owners. They did not give a damn like where their satellites were. All they cared about was that, like, when they are getting the signals back and forth. That's it. Mm -hmm. So they did not w wanted to know even that, like, whether if their satellite is going to collide with other satellites or not. And they didn't had even if someone like uh, US Stratcom or NORAD uh, issues the space track uh, warnings, saying that like okay your satellite is in collision course with another satellite, they didn't had any capacity or capabilities on board to maneuver it, right? And this has been changing with the like lot of uh, satellites being put in orbit these days, like as you mentioned in the uh, introduction, and uh, this is changing the perspective. So now there is a little bit of uh, fear in spe uh, spacecraft owners and operators that like there is this risk which is not uh, ignorable or negligible anymore. Do you see CubeSats as a threat? Or, I mean, theoretically they are launched to a very low uh, orbit, so they will die in a few years, hopefully, depending, of course, the, how many kilometers high. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they are definitely a threat. They are sweeping multiple orbital um, altitudes and regions, right? So they are usually launched around 450 to 500 kilometers mm -hmm. altitude. And from there, even if they are decaying, so they have to come down sweeping through the area below it. So when they are doing it, so it could be even threat to the ISS as well. Mm -hmm. And last year, ISS uh, informed that like they performed 193 maneuvers uh, just to avoid collision against the debris. That's approximately one in every two days, right? statistically speaking. So the risk is increasing. That is um, non-disputable at the moment. So the average in 2010, it used to be something like uh, uh, the satellite performs one maneuver for avoiding collisions, not station keeping, not orbit maintenance, but just for avoiding the maneuvers, like once in three to four years. Today, like every satellite is performing at least two maneuvers per year. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the amount of increase that you can see. So it's increasing exponentially. If the things continue to, uh, continues in the same fashion, so this is going to be something like tenfold, even might be hundredfold, which requires constant maneuvering of your satellite, maybe multiple times a day. So that is not too far away, uh, too far away, uh, at least a couple of decades. Yes. So the main, uh, these objects, are, of, of course, are the main uh, threat for human uh, spaceflight, right? So. But in case of CubeSats, it's uh, easy to calculate their uh, orbits, or I mean, the sizes, they are trackable, and you know you can predict maybe months or years how they will uh, fall down slowly. So you you can still you know predict what's going to happen in the future or. How do you see it? Uh, there are um, how, how many much how much is space weather? changing uh, significantly significant. okay. significantly so whether you are in this uh, peak of 11 year solar cycle mm -hmm. of this uh, peak then your orbit decays almost 70 percent faster than if you are in uh, the crust of uh, the solar cycle so that's the like range of uncertainty that you deal with so it could be three years or it could be 10 years so that's the window where you can decay your satellite if nothing else changes just because of the space weather. Mm. So what do you think, what should, should be done here or what's the best, uh, best solution? Um, there are uh, kind of efforts on the policy side. Now every nation, at least the subscribed nations for UNUSA and UN Corpus, they are enforcing the regulation on their national side saying that every future satellite should be maneuverable. They are not uh, entitled to increase the debris because they say that like, okay, I cannot maneuver. And there are, uh, they are trying to enforce also some kind of, uh, of fines and uh, liabilities for their littering in the space. So, uh, so making all the future satellites maneuverable is uh, first step towards it, like uh, you it can drag it. Economically feasible, for example, in case of a free unit CubeSat, uh, to really, it, it might destroy some business, business models or even be, I mean, very expensive for the technology demonstration for some, you know, other. Does it, yes, yes. Does it is it worth it or? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now we have reached the technological readiness level of many technologies, like whether it's a cold thrust propulsion system or an thrust uh, propulsion systems, or even passive maneuvering. You can uh, just uh, change the orientation of your solar uh, panels and using the remnants of uh, atmospheric uh, particles in the higher atmosphere, you can change the ma maneuver your uh, satellite, just like the planes can glide through the atmosphere. You can try to glide through this thin thermosphere uh, above the atmosphere as well. And th this technologies required methodologies all existing out there today. So one can do it in an economically viable fashion without uh, sacrificing their uh, interest of, uh, on the commercial side to say like, yeah. Okay. What to see, what are the main, you know, what are your favorite technologies uh, being developed right now for, uh, let's say, the orbiting or uh, um, yeah, the, the one is uh, this uh, differential drag, it's called. Mm -hmm. So what you do is that like, even if it is a CubeSat, it's extremely simple uh, way of dealing with it. You have a cube and you open up your cube at the end of your life. So you just increase the surface area so that like it falls down much faster than it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Or like you have just this mechanism to change the surface area of your CubeSat so that like you can um, maneuver your satellite. And also in future, if you can have uh, the possibility to modify these things as a wings itself, so you can have the lift or drag, so you can raise or lower your orbit if provided that you are below 550 kilometers, not beyond that one. So if you're below these things, then like you, can, you don't even need an active propulsion system. All you have to do is that like uh, get, get a pilot license for your satellites and then like you can fly it through the atmosphere. Uh, but now we're com coming more to the space traffic management topic maybe yeah. because if we are starting changing the orbits, right, then we create a new, because earlier, okay, we are able to track with radars and optical uh, telescopes, all the orbits that, yeah. uh, all the objects that we have on orbit. Right. But now if, a, let's say a CubeSat or whatever, a small satellite or a larger one starts jumping around there, left and right, up and down, then 
all the models and catalogs that we already have today, they are worthless because it's, yes. it shows only the history, what was there, but we need to actually need a new layer of data predicting the future. So what are we going to do? Not not right now, but let's say in one, one day, in uh, one hour. So how do you see uh, this issue being? Okay, uh, even today, uh, so all the satellites, if you track the object in the orbit, especially in low Earth orbit, so the latency at which you can make use of this information before you can retrack it successfully is less than three days. Yeah, so that means to say that like all these objects which are you're maintaining in a catalog, you have to keep them tracking every two to three days. If you do not do that one, you're losing this uh, object and then you have to reacquire this object by different means of tracking. And in case if it is maneuvering, it's even more challenging, as you said, that like you have to detect this maneuver because all these operators mostly not willing to share the information yet. And so that like one has to have the schemas in their processing chain so you can detect the maneuver and then also to estimate the maneuver and then like you can update your catalog to say that like, okay, I'm not pointing my telescope here today, but to see the same object, I'm pointing it slightly off so that uh, I can still successfully track this object. So uh, again, the required algorithm side or the processing chain side, it's all existing. So the um, people have developed these technologies uh, well in advance. So the main uh, question here is about to the satellite operators. So how can we get them to share information what they are going to do in future? So it's mainly for the... What, what do you mean exactly? So like I mean, uh, exactly. So if you want to have this new information about right. what is going to happen in future. So the main um, question is then to the satellite operators. So if they are willing to share the data or right. what should the government do so that they have to share this information, right? That's a really fantastic question. Actually, it's one of the most challenging and the happening part within the industry of STM, at least mm -hmm. space traffic management. So how like you can protect your IPR or your confidentiality and still be able to participate in the active space traffic management and pr be um, accommodative to the co within the community. So uh, this is a very challenging part. So people are still proposing different solutions to it, how one can do it, like uh, uh, camouflaging the data or uh, uh, reducing the information content within the data or just sharing just uh, the, that bit of information. As I mentioned, that like uh, you need to know where is uh, your satellite and then like you, need, uh, you can plan ahead of the things. So what one of the solution is that like I say that like instead of orbits, I give the information as a straight line. So this is the straight line which is coming to your satellite, move away from this line. So I do not give any other information. So after this straight line, I don't know where this uh, orbit goes or so on. Uh, on the other hand, it's also that like how to trust this and how to make this more secure uh, for all this information exchange. Do you trust the uh, SST data today? Right, yes. Um, th there is uh, no other means apart from trusting it. Mm -hmm. It's um, you're forced uh, to. You have, you have no option, right? Uh, exactly. So I always use an analogy of uh, I have my watch, and I have to believe whatever the time it shows. If I do not have any other uh, GPS uh, or mobile phone or uh, atomic clocks to calibrate my watch against it, so today I have just this watch. I completely have to rely on this. So uh, th this is the situation in STM and also in SST that like we have one source of information at the moment. Mm -hmm. So um, in future, it's changing slowly and uh, that there are some commercial actors coming into picture. So like Leo Labs or uh, Exo Analytica, but again, mostly uh, US players. Um, me personally, I would like to see more of European players getting into action and uh, start providing uh, the data services as well. But uh, there do, is... Uh, do we have like in it. Europe startups right now mm -hmm. gathering uh, with radars or optical devices or is it only government uh, done? Um, 
Yes, institutional, not governments, Institution, but yeah, institutional, yeah. because uh, many of the observatories in Europe are owned by um, uh, the research institute or entities like Fraunhofer in Germany, or uh, the universities uh, who are operating and uh, uh, maintaining these observatories, which were uh, basically developed uh, for scientific and research purposes. But now, since there is a need, they are also participating in SST side of it. Okay. So where, from GAV perspective, where do you see in STM the biggest challenge, or what's the, you know, what's the main uh, main gap today, or what is missing? Is it more the, the technology part? As I understand, it's more or less there, <laughs> but is it then the regulations, policy? Uh, I would say uh, a bit of both uh, technology the mindset, and uh, actually all three of them, <laughs> and then the policy as well. <laughs> so uh, in, uh, in the community of SSA, there are like these three tranches, you know, so that's uh, one thing that like everything could be solved only with development of algorithm. And uh, another tranche or uh, portion of people, uh, they say that like, okay, everything could be solved only with uh, improving and implementing the software technology uh, and required solution for that one. And another guys are more on the the quantum side say that like everything is statistical you know nothing can be certain so we have to improve our models we have to improve our understanding on the physics side and so on and so forth but for me uh, i personally believe and also what uh, gmv believes is that like uh, you, there should be a good perspective of the entire system on the technological side which brings all these three factors in a good portion and on the policy side, it has to change as well. So for the exchange of the data, for the communication of this data, and since there is no willingness uh, from individual actors and players, so the policy have to drive the community towards uh, or forcing them to do it so. Mm -hmm. So uh, why I really love space traffic management, the topic is that it's a mix of both technology, right. law, and also policy making. So it's, you have to, um, been really involved in all of these areas to, mm -hmm. to really do something. And it's luckily also European Union and uh, ESA is also working on different technology development. So I think in, in Europe, we are on a, on a right track. But now one of the main uh, discussions, in, I think in the next years, will be really how to set up, you know, a European space traffic management platform or actually we shouldn't talk only European, but it has to be a global solution since your uh, space or our orbit, it's a common resource. So it's uh, theoretically open, uh, should be open to everyone. Absolutely. So who should be uh, really leading this discussion? I mean, one is technology development, everyone can do it, right? But uh, who should be the, let's say, owner or shouldn't, or should it be somehow decentralized or Okay. How, how do you, how do you see from uh, maybe uh, from policy and technology perspective how really such a interesting platform should be set up? That, that's very very interesting question as well. And uh, uh, maybe I'll start the answer from the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. the first part of your question itself. Uh, for the platform, how it should look like and uh, what it should do. Uh, actually, there is an initiative and uh, and. Estonian company Gattime itself is working uh, on that one, or uh, eventually uh, going to work on that one. Is uh, uh, there is an activity from ESA initiated called CREAM, mm -hmm. stands for uh, Collision Risk Assessment and Automated Mitigation. So th th this is a, a coordination platform where they want to bring all these individual elements that you mentioned. So from the tracking part, all the players to exchange the data and to uh, talk to them, and like they have the regulators or the policymakers to have the overview of what's happening and so on. Uh, and uh, in this regard, so it's uh, uh, so there are been effort made, and it's going in the right direction. That, that's a good sign for uh, space traffic management itself. For the second part of the question, who should lead this activity? Um, the humble and kind of intuitive answer I would uh, say is basically it should be a kind of trans-European uh, or international overseeing body, so that like. Uh, it should be impartial towards any one single nation or commercial entity. So it's the management rules, uh, the traffic management rules are still evolving uh, and have not been established concretely. 
And until it reaches the maturity where one can say that like, okay, so when the traffic light says red, you have to stop and it says green, you have to move. It's universal. And uh, it was not generated by one single particular interest, right? In the same way, until it matures, so this has to be uh, overseen by one of the European uh, bodies or um, like United Nations bodies. Yeah, today in uh, Europe, European Commission does not really say to European country, countries how to design a national space law. So we are we can do everything what we theoretically what we want yes yes <laughs> do you think it should be it should change so we should have uh, let's say similar national space law in every european country or should it still be open for uh, governments like estonia germany spain right. to decide by their own so, so how sh how much standardization should we have in case of uh, here in here in Europe, for example, what do you think? Is it, should we have, uh, let's say, European <laughs> space law or should it be up to the country? That, that would be ideal, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be an ideal situation and a fantastic uh, kind of space utopian situation to say that like everything is working <laughs> fantastically fine and there is no problem at all anymore. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, of course, there are um, uh, friction between uh, different organizations and nations really? and uh, <laughs> naturally <laughs> naturally <laughs> uh, you, you would not believe it even until today people do not share that like how the data is generated like uh, what's the underlying process schema so they think that like that's the proprietary property of this particular agency or any other entity so uh, the, the willingness is uh, still uh, uh, prehistoric or <laughs> very <laughs> uh, very backward so that like they have to um, evolve in this sense um, so there are many regulations uh, from and uh, policy recommendations uh, uh, sorry not regulations but recommendations which are uh, done by various multiple entities uh, and also United Nations uh, organizations is also providing this uh, recommendations and based on that one, how one does it or one how uh, does not do it is the question of it. it, it it's very similar to what's happening in um, a, a environmental uh, policies, right? So the, the question is that like whether if only Germany does it, is it sufficient? Or if only Estonia does it, is it sufficient? And let's say our neighboring countries are not adhering to the same set of laws. So will I be still affected or will I be not be affected by it? So if I am sacrificing, uh, sacrificing my economical growth by um, enforcing this stricter regulations on the traffic, uh, traffic management, and let's say uh, someone in uh, Southern Hemisphere, Australia or New Zealand says that like, no, we are uh, brand new countries in this uh, domain, and uh, we just uh, deregulate everything so anyone can fly however they want. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's the situation. So uh, definitely, uh, in short form, to answer your question, uh, so it should, it should be, be European. Yes, yeah. yeah. A, a, a unified uh, policy will do much good for in long term. And yeah, we yes. can already see it even today. So Estonia has no space law. Some other countries who have, in case of Europe, right, have a, have a space law. Then uh, these companies are interested to come to Estonia since it's unregulated, right? right yet. So. Right. Um, and space law might be an ab enabler, but it can be blocking for some certain companies, depending on the space missions, what they are planning to uh, send. So we have already so some examples which, which say, say that we need to have, let's say, similar space laws in, um, in Europe. But what do you think if, um, let's say, we will go for a unified space law or does it mean that the space law has to say on the national level anyway, there has to be a national right. law, right? Yeah. Uh, so does it have to say to the satellite operators and the owners that it's mandatory to, um, to uh, give away uh, pre-notifications? So all the satellite operators have to share the information with their own government and uh, let's say Estonian satellite operators sh should change uh, should inform the government that in X hours or I don't know, which doesn't matter, for X time we are going to do a deorbit manoeuvre 
and uh, then it's up to Estonia if we are going to distribute this information or to no. right, yeah. uh, other countries, okay. let's say Finland, Germany or to the United Nations, that our space object, which is currently orbiting there, will you know, do something else in uh, five hours. Right. Is it the right way forward? Should the government um, put this kind of, uh, let's say, in legislation that you need to share your uh, operational data? I would say, in short, yes, the, it's definitely the best uh, uh, way when you're considering about being accommodative to all uh, the space operators and uh, owners of uh, the infrastructures, whether it's civilian or it's whether national entity for uh, scientific purpose or it's whether it's defense entity. So everyone needs to cooperate because in orbits, you cannot say that like just about this borders are my space. Mm -hmm. Once you put an uh, object in the orbit, it goes across the globe, irrespective of it. Only especially if you put it in a uh, higher inclination or low inclination, then you cover the band of the Earth. But r irrespective of it, you cover the whole globe, right? So you, you are sweeping a uh, vast amount of space, um, yeah, not only the space around your country or nation or continent. So in that regard, it would be a great move um, if uh, Estonia ever does that one. It would be a kind of role model for the rest of the Europe as well to follow. Th said that one, actually, I wanted to make a comment about uh, the title of the conference, that software defined space. Uh, it's fantastic, actually, you came up with that Thank one. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's also like if we play with the words, also it's not only software defined space in technical sense. So on the philosophical sense, software is actually defining the space, whether it's sure. uh, the mission analysis or on the uh, operations or on the processing side, everything software is defining the space today. And it's, uh, in that sense, I think it's very apt that like to have uh, this title. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a very long idea. story how uh, we came up with the name uh, of software defined space. And uh, a year ago, or well, it's the beginning of this year, we had uh, long discussions how to, what does it mean? And uh, we still have heard uh, a lot of critics about it. <laughs> but somehow I believe that uh, in the next months it will be also in Wikipedia. Oh, fantastic. All right. <laughs> Congratulations. So I think that. we should, uh, we, yeah, it's also, I mean, software defined space, it's connected to space traffic management. So how we use software to really regulate the space and how right. we are using it, changing it. So. I think uh, next next year uh, we should really come up with a definition. <laughs> so what does the software uh, design space mean? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and also on the expertise level, right? A uh, few years ago, I came across a small comic strip. So the two astronauts repairing the space station and having a conversation. And uh, one astronaut asked, like, uh, why did you become an astronaut? And another astronaut said that, like, I did not get into Google. So that's why he became an astronaut. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's the situation today. Like, actually, a lot of development is happening outside the space. And especially, the Estonia is a good example on the cybersecurity level or the communication or exchange, information exchange technologies. So there is great advancement and uh, capabilities in outside the space domain. Mm -hmm. And now is the time that, like, space looks outwards. Because in the past, space used to be, like, kind of the forefront of the technological development. And now it's the time that like uh, th there are so many advancements uh, technologically mm -hmm. yeah, space has to adapt for that one and that's why i said like software defining space like as well like yeah okay. how we operate let's go back to the pre notifications uh, yeah. topic we had we had just before software <laughs> defined space but yeah. i will think we will continue the software defined space discussion also but mm -hmm. uh, a lawyer a good friend of mine uh, she said that uh, a space lawyer that uh, these pre-notifications are dangerous because should the government really know what their satellite operators are up to? Because if, if they really know what their satellite operators are doing, then they are more liable than not knowing. So what do you think about this uh, argument? So theoretically, <laughs> you know, the Outer Space Treaty says that we need to exchange the information or share information what we are doing. But is it maybe even better that we don't know it? <laughs> it's uh, the question, same as whether the government tracks everyone's uh, emails or no, whatsoever. Like, yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> but uh, but at the same time, uh, there are uh, technologies to uh, still safeguard the. Uh, integrity and confidentiality, but while just monitoring for 
some kind of threats or something. In the same way, uh, if there is a possibility to kind of share this information without disclosing or uh, sharing the information what exactly the company is doing, but just to uh, share the information of, okay, I'm here, but there is this threat, so I'm going to move away or give this information to this another partner of us. So that, that would be ideal situation, but uh, for that, uh, the developments and uh, research are much required still, how to do it and what's the way ahead over there. Okay. There has been also discussions and the one idea I really love is to have a decentralized space traffic management. So Absolutely. No one is, the, is it the right way forward or should still GMV, European Union or United States be responsible for that or is st still what, what's what's your opinion that who should be really the owner of you know because someone has to in the end run this platform or if you say decentralized it should not be a single entity who is running yes. it right so it should be everyone who is participating it that would be ideal situation again can we can we yeah. can we achieve an ideal situation on earth <laughs> Provided there is a willingness uh, within the community and all the stakeholders, th definitely uh, I think it would be uh, nice to have feature within STM. But okay, if you have now let's say hundreds of you know participants to a decentralized uh, network, how can we uh, trust all the information we are getting? For example, there might be fake um, you know pre warnings or fake satellites that don't exist on orbit, but uh, data that is just being sent from, let's say, s some random countries that uh, our satellite I is here, but actually there was no satellite, it's just to make, uh, you know, disturb others. Will we, how, how should we deal uh, with this kind of issues in the future? Um, it's a very tough question, uh, mainly because there is no answer for that. At least I do not know the answer. And uh, if there is a possibility to have this particular discussion in more in detail, even like kind of a brainstorming session, uh, th this should definitely be pushed. And uh, if you can take care through uh, your initiatives here in Estonia and provide this uh, initiatives or solutions, I I'm kind of very confident whether it's European Union or Commission or EU SST program or ESA or any other satellite and operators, they will be very much willing to adapt uh, the methodology. So maybe it could be uh, one of the topics for next year, how to uh, make it sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Do you have questions from the audience? I know that we have also huge space traffic management fans uh, here. <laughs> I can see that uh, Rauno, Rauno is already... Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so Rauno Gordon from Tallinn University of, Te of Technology. Um, so um, I saw a couple of years ago, sorry, a couple of days ago, right, like, like very recently, uh, you, uh, FCC in the US uh, created a new regulation. I hope it, it was, I hope I understood correctly that it's not fake news that they uh, regulate all satellites that are US-based uh, after their, their mission life should come down in five years. Correct. So it seems like a very big step in the, in the right direction. I hope that other players, are, uh, other countries are also coming along. <clears throat> but, but also it, it like raises concerns. Like in Tallinn right now, we are developing a very small satellite, uh, smaller than a, than a CubeSat, and we cannot afford any propulsion so right. we can't re really uh, do anything about the orbit. And if we launch within two years, then uh, possibly we can use a SpaceX rideshare launch. Mm -hmm. If we launch later, then we have to uh, like follow the regulation and, and do something about our orbit, come down after our maybe one or two year lifetime. Right. Um, so maybe we have to choose some other, other uh, like launch providers or, or something like that. But, but um, so what, what do you think about the, the whole thing? How, what, what other aspects does it raise? Concerns or, or good uh, things? In principle, from the space traffic management, uh, it's very good initiative from FCC already, like because the 25 years guidelines, which was done in the past from IADC, it was not uh, logically quantified uh, why it was done and so on. But with the increased number of objects to be uh, being launched, uh, it's, uh, this five years regulation is uh, very much needed, uh, required. Uh, said that one, like in your case, um, it states clearly that at the end of life, that means your satellite is not operational anymore. If your intended mission is to broadcast some radio frequency, then if the satellite stops doing that one, and you have five years from that day, 
But if you are saying that like if you are smaller than CubeSat, so I, I believe or I, I guess that like you have a solar panels for power, and then uh, you are going to have this uh, communication with it uh, for longer period of time, and without having any propulsion system, it will already have a natural decay anyhow. And uh, if you account in your mission planning that it can somehow sustain this signal broadcasting for significant amount of time until it reaches maybe 350 or 400 kilometers, you'll be well within the guidelines. So this is the cheat sheet, right? Like for small satellites uh, case. But uh, other than that one, it would be fantastic that like if uh, uh, CubeSat as well, like as I mentioned before, that like there are many passive uh, mechanisms. There are tethers, so you just deploy a long wire. So uh, Earth's magnetic field induces the current in it, and then uh, it removes the energy in form of the heat, and then like your ob object comes down. Or uh, the uh, drag or you can just have the structure uh, like reopening it and increase the area to mass ratio and uh, uh, or just have a, a kind of a sail uh, you know so th there are different mechanisms so if you can adapt one of these mechanisms as well it will be much more effective and also um, kind of being the forefront of um, following the regulations or recommendations for uh, betterment of the community just, yeah just to add something I also believe that we have to get rid of satellites that are not working. Yeah. But it's also very, without space, space traffic management, it is very difficult and even dangerous to the orbit. Right. So therefore we need to have this pre-warning system. Otherwise we, I think it's even more safe to have a debris circling around the globe than just doing random the right. orbits. So it's definitely doing the orbiting without space traffic management and pre-warnings it might be even more dangerous. Absolutely, you're absolutely correct. And uh, really, uh, we have to uh, unfortunately stop the discussion here. Time, time is out. Uh, so uh, Srinivas, really thank you for joining and uh, thank you for coming to Tallinn. Uh, from this fireside chat, I got many ideas for next year. What are the technology and also policy topic that, topics that we can uh, focus on next year and maybe even have some discussions or some, let's say short uh, workshops before to really exchange and uh, think about in which direction we should go and uh, also very very good input for my work to write the Estonian national space law so really thank you for being here and uh, thank you for, thank you for the audience and please Th thank you very much for having me here it was great pleasure and uh, uh, looking forward for all the initiatives from Estonian side and the developments of it thanks thank you so thanks.